Hello, welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This is a show about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the lead engineer at IT Pro TV, an ACI learning company. With me today is Cameron Guerra, one of the engineers on my team. Thanks for joining me today, Cam. Thanks for having me, Taylor. Pleasure as always. I'm just really excited about today. I think we've got some uh, great content ahead of us. It's going to be talking a little bit about a language extension called Type Applications. So uh, if you're familiar with Haskell, you've probably heard of Type Applications. If you're new to Haskell, um, I think we're going to be in for a special treat today. We're going to kind of walk through Type Applications, you know, what, what's helpful about it, what's you know maybe confusing about it, uh, and really dive in um, to a post that uh, Zach Wood uh, wrote called Haskell's at symbol Type Applications. So, uh, to kick off, uh, he, he, I think, probably works with uh, IHP, which is Integrated Haskell Platform, and he is trying to help explain um, some of the extensions that are um, <clears throat> kind of on by default when you're using the, the IHP plat, you know, uh, framework, I believe is really mm -hmm. what it is at the end of the day. Um, and so... Yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, type applications, Taylor. Yeah. For context, like you mentioned, the IHP is a framework for building web applications with Haskell. And if you're familiar with Ruby on Rails, I think it tries to be a lot like that. So it aims to be very developer friendly. And one of the things that you often want to do with Haskell is have a function that is polymorphic that can be used in a lot of different contexts, but then you need to pick which context you're using it in. So the example he gives is if you're like querying for something from the database, that function should clearly allow you to query for many different types of things. Let's say like a user or an episode for us, that's one of our data models. Um, but you are gonna wanna pick which thing you're querying for. So that's where type applications can come in as a solution to that problem, where you have this polymorphic function and you say, I wanna use it with this specific type. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think type applications is a great way to fix this. Um, and for us, we actually had this kind of similar problem where we had a query that could return all kinds of different things. And if we didn't use it in another context, it couldn't figure out you know what type we were trying to query there. So um, we actually used to do um, just kind of type assertion at the um, variable declaration. So <clears throat> that was you know all right. We have a user who's colon colon type user and then that's bound from the query that we were running so you mm -hmm. know that's another way to do what type application does um, yeah and funny note about that that requires a different language extension right. called scoped type variables to be able to give a type signature when you bind a variable so either on the left side of one of the arrows in do notation or on the left side of an equal sign in a let statement um, otherwise, you have to either give the type signature on some other line later in the function where you use the thing, mm -hmm. or on the right side, you would give like colon colon like IO user or the the type of the whole expression where the thing comes from rather than just that piece you care about. Yeah, true, true, true. Yeah, thank you for that correction. But yeah, that was also something we used to do before we even had scope type variables. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I think type applications cleaned up the code a little bit over scope type variables um, because, you know, we could kind of read the function we were, we were writing and then say, oh, hey, here's what type that thing needs to return. Or here's that, really, here's that type that needs to be filled into the polymorphic piece of this function. Yeah. And so... And one of the reasons I think that we didn't use type applications or scoped type variables for a while is that in general, I try to avoid using language extensions, but these ones, we had enough polymorphic functions where the utility was just undeniable. And mm -hmm. instead of ending up writing like a find user function and a find episode function and a find this, find that, you just have one find function and you pass the at type name for the next thing. And it feels like you get a lot of the same benefits as if you had a lot of different monomorphic functions. Right, right. And, you know, I mean, I know you know, the habit is to shy away from a language extension before, you know, going to it um, until you see that use case. And I think for us, we really did find that use case. 
Uh, you know, and the nice thing about type applications as a language extension is it's pretty well known around the, the community and, you know, it's even going to be in the release of GHC 2021, which we've talked about in previous podcasts. So, you know, there's a lot of community understanding around type, app, type applications and, you know, it's something, there's a lot of, you know, tutorials on what it does and how it works, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and this post is another opportunity to kind of show what power it has. Um, but we, we, you know, we've been praising type applications a lot, but I know there is one thing that's kind of, uh, tricky when it comes to type applications and that's what, like when you put an at symbol in some type, you think it may be a variable to the function when it's really not. Uh, Yeah. This can be really confusing because, uh, the at sign, you might think it could be used as an operator. So if you had some identifier at sign some some other identifier that could be a normal operator call like plus or you know something like that Mm -hmm. but it actually it can't be in haskell because the at sign is reserved for this special thing when you bind variables or when you match on them so like if you want to match on a list and destructure the head and the tail using colon but you want to hang on to that overall list you can do that with the at sign so you do the like whole term on the left and then at sign and then some destructuring pattern on the right. Um, so th- that's one way that type applications can be a little confusing is that this at sign is overloaded, but fortunately, uh, the like space around the operator is what disambiguates it. So if you have a space before the at sign, you know that it's going to be a type application. Right. And then, yeah, I mean, and that's, that's one thing. The other thing too is, you know, the order of passing these type types through type applications matters because, you know, if there's multiple polymorphic variables in a function, you have to make sure you pass this in order or you probably get, I mean, I, I imagine the compiler errors are pretty helpful, but it could still be pretty confusing. So um, they might be pretty gnarly, especially if you have types of different kinds. So like if one of your type arguments is meant to be some monad. So it takes another type as an argument and you try to pass something like int to that, the kinds aren't going to match up. And I think most Haskell programmers probably don't run into that type of error very often. So it might be a little mystifying. Um, but yeah, the, the order of the arguments is important. And usually the order that type variables appear in a type signature is okay. Like that's the order that you would want to supply them but sometimes it's not, right? You want to change the order. So how would you do that? Yeah, so that's uh, our good friend, the for all statement, right? Isn't that mm-hmm. a thing? Yet another yeah. language extension. Ooh, yeah, which I, we don't tend to use it very often in our day to day. So for me, that's a little fuzzy. So I'm gonna actually bounce that back to you and ask sure. you about it. <laughs> <laughs> so. The way that I like to think about for all is sort of a type level Lambda. I think pretty much any Haskell programmer is going to be comfortable writing a Lambda with a bunch of variables and then an arrow. And for me, for all is kind of the same thing on the type level where you have the for all and then a bunch of type variables and then a period, and then you have the type signature after that. So it's a way of explicitly listing all the type variables you're going to use so that you can give them in a particular order. Hmm. Okay. That's, I mean, yeah, I I knew it was a thing in Haskell, but I didn't really ever understand the reasoning for it. Um, You know, we generally don't have super overly polymorphic functions where we have to, you know, and where the order always matters or something along those lines. So Mm -hmm. for us, you know, we, we haven't really run into that too much personally. Yeah, and it's kind of funny because the for all is actually always there. It's just implied Mm -hmm. that if you mention a type variable and you haven't uh, quantified it, if you haven't given it by using one of these for all things, then GHC will just do that for you. And sometimes you'll see this on an error message where it'll print out a type signature and it'll have a for all there, but it's not actually in your source code. And you may wonder, where did that come from? GHC just put it in there for you. It's magic. I know. I feel like today we could even talked about uh, GHC 9.0.1 being released. And then we have some yeah. excitement it's got, about that. It's got some fancy type stuff in there, but maybe we should do a whole whole separate episode on that one. There's a lot to unpack. That's fair. Yeah. But <laughs> if you're interested in it, it's out there. Just you know, as yes. a, a friendly Haskell reminder for those who 
want to dive on into that. I mean, I just um, assume people are already reading the newsletter, right? They're already subscribed to the Haskell Weekly newsletter. I, <laughs> I mean, if you're not, I would definitely go do it now. Mm -hmm. It's just an email once a week. That's it. You don't get too much information. It's not like he's we're trying it's to spam you or anything. We're just trying to show oh. you some Haskell love, man. Yeah, but uh, on the topic of type applications, is there anything else you wanted to cover here? <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Um, what else did I want to say? I wanted to say something, but now I'm forgetting, which is great. Uh, do you have anything you want to add? Because I'm blanking at the moment. It's Friday afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry. Yeah, so we talked about some other... Uh, ways that we did stuff that type application can do for us. So like scope type variables are just manually giving a type signature. One other very common pattern that type applications replaces is passing around proxy arguments. So if you're not familiar, proxy is a data type that doesn't convey any information at the value level. All of its information is in the type level. So if you wanted to pass like the pass a type to a function, you might do that with a proxy. This is very common with the servant library. That's how it passes around all this API stuff and lets you hold on to that as a value. Mm -hmm. um, but with type applications, you don't really need to use proxy at all. You can replace that with an explicit type application. So that's nice. You just get rid mm -hmm. of this concept altogether. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's not, I mean, I'm all for type applications. I think it's been a great quality of life improvement for our code base um and as a you know engineer i it helps me work faster and more effect effectively um and also yeah. read code faster first you know obviously at first it was really weird i remember um <clears throat> the engineer who kind of was like all about it cody he was like hey let's let's do this and i reviewed that pr and i was just like okay i think i get it <laughs> uh, but at that yeah, point you know it takes a minute to wrap your head around but i think once you know what it does, there's not really a downside to this language extension. Some language extensions have a little bit of give and take. This one is just give. It lets you express something that you weren't able to do before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's great. Um, is there anything else from the post that you were um, you know, interested in or intrigued you? Because um, obviously we, we talked a little bit about the post, but not a ton. He was, you know, this was a great opportunity for us to have a good jumping off point, um, but we didn't really dive too much into the actual post um i mean it was a great post i really like reading uh zach has put out a handful of posts and i like reading all of them um mm -hmm. this also gave me some good insight or like kind of day in the life slice of life type stuff about ihp i haven't used it myself but i've seen a lot of people excited about it in the community and i like what it's trying to do so i like seeing posts like this that give me a taste of it yeah i know i think he's gonna have to do some follow-up posts too because he's got two other language extension he uses in the posts that yeah. he actually had comments in the post about, which was really, yeah. and he was very quick to react. So I'm sure if you have more questions, I think Zach's got yeah. you. Exactly. Um, exactly. <laughs> Did you just Can't escape that? the puns. I didn't mean to. Wow. Just Sorry, subconsciously Zach. punning all the time. <laughs> That's life. Um, but yeah, Cam, like you mentioned, I think next week we'll have to talk about GHC nine, but I think that'll do it for us this week, unless you got anything else. I don't think so. I mean, it's a great quick topic. Um, I mean, the, o the only other thing I was thinking about talking about was examples. So if, if you, do you think we should talk about some examples? Like, yeah, where let's it's go ahead. really good. Um, um, so yeah. he gives a couple in the post, right? Right. He uses read and show as a great example because, you know, read takes a string and returns an A and show takes an A and returns a string. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can for the read function, you can assert it. Um, or you can always write a wrapper function that gives it explicit types. But if you don't want to do that, you can use type applications to right. say, hey, I want this string one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four to become an int. And you just do read at int this string. Yeah. So it'll transform it and obviously create a runtime error if it can't do that. But you know, it tries, which you know, I think that was a great example. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Some more for us that we see on a more day-to-day -day basis is, you know, from from integral or real to frac to, you know, transform one integral type to another integral type. Um, yeah. 
you know, these that. are like the Swiss army knife conversion functions. They're used for so many things like from a machine sized integer into some specific sized unsized unsigned integer, or mm -hmm. like from a database type into a normal type or from a time to, or, you know, just all kinds of things have surprising instances where you can convert it with from integral. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I encourage people to write monomorphic wrapper functions, like specifically from this type to that type. But with type applications, you can say from integral at this type, at that type, and then you don't need to write that extra function. You just kind of define it in line as it were. Yeah. Which, you know, pros and cons, but if you're kind of familiar with the extension, I think it's a you know easy thing to grok, you know. Mm -hmm. Obviously if you're new to a code base and you've never seen type applications before, yeah, you're gonna be like, wait a second, why is this that way? We should have just made it a separate function. Right. But you know. That actually reminds me, um one thing we didn't touch on yet that I think we should is that with type applications, sometimes a function will have, let's say, two type variables and you want to only supply the second one. So you're like whatever the first one is, if you want to infer it, that's fine. But the second one needs to be int. Mm -hmm. And you can do that with type applications where instead of saying at some type name, you say at underscore, and that tells GHC, go ahead and do what you were going to do here anyway. Just pretend I'm not here and I'll, I'll do the next thing. Right. And that's, you know, where that order matters. Cause if you try to just apply the second one, it would then infer it as the first one. Right. So putting that. Yeah, so like with from it. integral, if, if in your context, the first type variable is already picked for you, so you don't want to specify it again, you would say from integral at underscore at int. And then that would say I'm converting into an integer. Right. Which that's, yeah, super nice little thing that uh, the type applications gave us. So yeah, much appreciated. Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, programmers who created this great <laughs> Yeah, it's a good one. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah, I feel like we've, We've said we're almost done for a couple times here, but I think we're actually almost done now. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I wanted to give give you guys some good content. I was like, "What? We need examples." So yeah, glad we got that opportunity. Sorry, but for yeah, the emotional roller coaster <laughs> of our listeners. Are we over? Are we not? We are. We're over. Thank you. But wait, <laughs> no, no, there's there's no more. Uh, yeah, thank you for listening to the Haskell Weekly podcast. I have been your host Taylor Fossack, and with me today was Cameron Guerra. Uh, if you want to find out more about Haskell Weekly, you can go to our website, haskellweekly.news. And if you enjoyed the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And if you have any feedback for us, tweet us at Haskell Weekly. And Haskell Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV, an ACI learning company, and our employer. They would like to offer you 30% off your subscription by using promo code HaskellWeekly30 at checkout. And that about does it for us, huh, Taylor? Sure does. Well, thanks for joining us this week on Haskell Weekly. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Peace.